Next on the Broadway show, Talk to Me Goose. Former Top Gun and ER star Anthony Edwards is on Broadway in the new play, Prayer for the French Republic. Plus, Leah Schreiber, Tyne Daly and more, starring in the revival of the Broadway parable, Doubt. And we're taking a walk with one of the stars of Anne Juliet, Austin Scott. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is the Broadway Show. It's a cold, cold winter, but Broadway is hot with huge stars and shows. I'm Tamsin Fidel. There is a very important piece of work on Broadway in 2024. It's Prayer for the French Republic. It's the story of a family grappling with anti-Semitism, both in present day and in the past. I caught up with one of the stars, Anthony Edwards. Well, let's talk about this. It's a, it's so nice to be back on Broadway, right? It's always great to be in a theater. Talk a little bit about this play and this production. Why is this one special? You know, I started acting when I was 16, and it, if it's always been the same thing. It's about the writing. Like, when the writing's great, you're like, well, there's half my job done, or more. That's what it comes down to, the writing. It's like the Grand Canyon. You can't describe it. You just have to be in it. To understand it because it's not one thing it's so many different things when it's this kind of stuff it's also fresh and new for audiences and that's really nice when you have topics too that are, are timeless topics or timely topics and that's what we're talking about here that's going to speak to an audience in a whole different way than it might have a few years ago yeah look i mean anti-semitism has been around for centuries and centuries obviously and so it's always going to speak or apply in a different way, just like any other crises of the human condition, which playwrights, great playwrights from name them all, mm -hmm. are always looking at. Right. They're, they're looking at what are the personal conflict within the larger scheme of things. I'm always fascinated by, uh, by the writing, as you said, to, to think about when it was written, how it was written, and then how it applies as you're sitting there in the audience. Yeah, and it's fun to watch a, a writer like Josh be like, well, I'm glad you got that from it. Like, <laughs> he just keeps presenting truths. We keep trying to interpret them. And David Cromer takes them all and puts it into this theater here. I know you were on Broadway uh, previously, but you have some things that have happened uh, in between there because it's not just uh, Broadway. You're not just on stage. It's TV. It's film. Yeah, well, you know, I'm 61 years old, and I started working when I was 16. And over these last 40-odd years, I've just really had this incredible thing that I didn't know was gonna happen, is that I started as an actor because I loved theater, and that was the place. It was Santa Barbara was just full of theater, and mm -hmm. full of, mm -hmm. of, of, and so I fell in love with it that way. But then I had this career in television and film, and now to be in this situation, where it's all back to that original, which is really trust in, in, in being with actors where, you, you trust, you have to find trust. And, and that's exciting because you're not relying on an editor. Right. Or, a, you know, or and, another take. Right. And also that thing that I think audiences always forget is that we, every actor on stage feels exactly what's going on in that theater. And audiences think they're anonymous and they're just watching in it like they're the movie or something where it's nothing they're gonna do. But it is actually this alive thing. So here we are. I mean, it's 2024 and theater still matters. We do need it. We and I also think to... it's because why so many people come back to it. Like you said, you do films, you do TV, right. but you always come back to the stage. And we get it in other ways. You see it like whatever, Taylor Swift, this phenomenal, mm -hmm. those people had an experience together in that thing. And that's what mm -hmm. we want. We want the music, the feel of love. or the, My favorite quote was Penn and Teller where, you know, at the end of the show they used to say, when you go home tonight, it's not, you know, how we do these tricks. Yeah. It's, that's not what's important. It's why, oh, you know? Right. And that always They're stuck great. with me, like, all oh, right, I need this. I need to be You're right. stirred. You're really right. And feel like, oh. No, no, ma'am, this is not a good idea. Sorry, Goose, but it's time to buzz the tower. 
you played a role years and years ago that is was gone and done, but has always, I have to imagine, stayed with you, mm. of Goose. Oh, and yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that one. Yeah. You know, the, the new one came out, but Goose was always remembered through all these years, mm -hmm. the significance and the importance of that role. Yeah, well, I, you know, it was a, I was in the right place at the right time with a director who wanted me to do that role when uh, the studio wanted a comedian. It was like, they gotta get a comedian there because it's gotta be this funny thing. And it was like, a director said, no, he's gotta be, we gotta believe that this is this guy's best friend. And when you're gonna take a hero and have him go through something, you gotta believe that love. You gotta believe that friendship. And so, you know, it was a you know a lot of smoke and mirrors and, and airplanes, but at the core of it, you know, people can relate to that. And so you feel, you know, that's where you go like, well, I'm glad, I'm happy for that. I'm happy that. Yeah, those that, things matter. Yeah, and that's what we, we do all this for, is so that we can stay in people's hearts and minds the way other performances stay in mind. We're taking a look at another one of the amazing shows soon to be headed to Broadway. It's the first ever Broadway revival of Doubt, a parable. The play marking the return of two Tony Award winners, Tyne Daly and Leah Schreiber. It's the story of a nun who suspects a priest of an inappropriate relationship. We got to know the stars. I got a call out of the blue. Would you like to be involved in a production of Doubt? And I said, I want to read it because I always want to read it. It starts with, you know, in the beginning is the word. And I read it and wondered if it was in any way dated after 20 years. And the following day, I opened up my New York Times and it was a full double page thing about the rot at the heart of the Baltimore uh, diocese. Signs and portents. This is not. This is a story that needs to be told again. And subsequently, there's been a whole reveal about what's happening in New Orleans. So topical, yes. Uh, worth looking at, yes, because the lives of the people, women and men, who devote themselves to a certain uh, a discipline of Mother Church, are really fascinating. I think it's perfect. This play is perfect. The, I had just come from mass with my in-laws um, uh, not being Catholic mass is something I don't normally do and it was very much on my mind I think also because I had spent so much time with Ray Donovan and with spotlight on these plays that uh, examined the Catholic Church in a very particular way and I read the play again and, and I just realized that it's such a layered and nuanced play and that there was a reason to do it now. You know, this really interesting and beautiful idea that John puts forward that, that doubt is actually a binding concept. If we can accept that we share doubt as a species and that's part of being human, it's an extraordinary idea. Liev has got a ferocious intellect uh, and tremendous uh, gifts. Uh, that are available to him and he's got a prowling mind uh, and so that really helps the show and Tyne is a force of nature and the two of them together it's Godzilla versus King Kong. When I read the play every time I read it I come away thinking something different I come away thinking the opposite of what I felt when I read it Bef you know the time before um, so I think it's I think it's a riveting story every time I've gone to the theater since it has felt safe again since the theaters reopened I felt this tremendous gratitude to have a communal experience um, and this show is so much about um, togetherness and what it means to be interconnected and um, the costs of that and the privileges of that and I'm very excited to feel this event happen live every night. It's time to take a walk with a Broadway star, so let's go ahead and send it out to Charlie Cooper. Austin, we're walking you to work today. Come on. Super excited to be <laughs> doing so. But listen, I'm most excited to talk about the fact that you get the opportunity to reinvent this classic show that people know and love. What's that like? to kind of take on the role of Shakespeare, which is, I mean, everybody knows Shakespeare. Yeah. It's a very different version of Shakespeare, which definitely helps. Nobody knows this version of Shakespeare. 
It was a lot of pressure, not a pressure, but it was a big mantle to be taking on, especially from Stark Sands, you know, who's so phenomenal. But pretty quickly, they just gave me so much room to play and like just make it my own. And, and it's just been, it's been so fun. Yeah. So fun. So I know that the show kind of like fuses some historical piece elements uh -huh. and also there's some modern elements as well. Did you ever find like that to be challenging to make it feel kind of cohesive? I did a little show called Hamilton back in the I day, know, right? which, which I think helped prepare <laughs> me for this. Yeah, it's interesting because he's such a, you know, he's has so many moments in the show when he is speaking in his Shakespearean speech that mm -hmm. he is famous for. And so finding a way to still kind of add my modern, like, you know, flair was a fun challenge yeah. for sure. Okay, so there's comedy, there's music, there's uh -huh. dancing. What's the hardest thing to nail in all of that? And I guess what's your favorite thing to nail? The hardest thing to nail. I think for me personally, the biggest challenge has been the comedy. Really? I, okay. pretty much my entire career, I've done predominantly drama. Yeah. You know, this is kind of my first time, which is part of the reason why I was so interested in doing it. Just kind of like playing with something new that I'd never played with Stretch before. Stretch yourself a little bit. Exactly, exactly. And everybody, I mean, I've got so many incredible people to look up to, Betsy Wolf, you know, so many incredible people in this show that I got to kind of just observe and play off of and stuff. And I love comedy now, it's so fun. There are uh, songs in there that people might recognize. Is there a favorite of yours at all? A favorite of mine? Yeah. You know, my favorite moment, I think my favorite song is What Do You Want From Me okay. by uh, Adam Lambert. David West Reed, the, the book writer, wove it so beautifully into the story. But I also like, I remember when that song came out and I was bopping to it and a lot of other people in my friend group might not have been, but I think that moment in the show, it's just so powerful and yeah. so, so well done. So I love that. Well, listen, we're here. We're here. We made it to work. I got to go in there and do a show, I, I suppose. Know. But, I know, I suppose. Are you going to yeah. hang out with us? Listen, you want to tell my, my boss? <laughs> <laughs> Austin, you're a blast. You're a joy. Break a leg. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, y'all. Thank you. Take care. Hi, I'm Danny Burstein, and you're watching The Broadway Show. Welcome back to The Broadway Show, everyone. I'm Tamsin Fidel. Let's get back to it. It's a musical a quarter century in the making. Now it's your last chance to see Barry Manilow and Bruce Sussman's remarkable musical, Harmony. The show, now slated to close February 4th. Here's Paul Wontorek. Was this a big audition? And what were the first impressions? Everyone knew that Barry and Bruce wrote this musical, but what was it like actually getting in front of them? You know, at first it was a little intimidating. You get the breakdown and you realize, wow, this is a big project with Barry on board, with Bruce on board, with Warren on board. Like, yeah. wow, this could change my life. Mm -hmm. But after you read the material and you read the story and understand what the show is about, it really became much more focused on that, right? You go into the room, you do your job, and you tell the story to the best of your ability. And honestly, it's it's been a, a pleasure, a treat. How soon a after you your first audition did you think you had it? Oh, hmm. I, I don't think that I thought I had it the whole way through until I got the phone call that I, that I knew. How about you, Danny? My final day, I went in and right before they were like, so you're going to be reading with Sierra Bogus. And up until then, I had no idea. And so I, I like took a moment being like, okay, cool, cool. She's yeah. literally the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. Um, one of the most talented. And I, I went in and I did my thing and I remember leaving and Warren came out and sat next to me and he said, you have so many fans in that room. Mm -hmm. And I just had the feeling, I, I, I think I knew then. It was truly a really welcoming room going with off of fans. They, all of them were behind the table, Ken, Warren, Bruce, Barry either was there or on Zoom. And it was just such a friendly, nurturing room where they just wanted the best work that we could provide. Bye. 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 In terms of authenticity of sound, 
these, yeah. these six by a mile. What kind of recordings, what kind of artifacts are there? I know there's a documentary film. A documentary film, and, and over the years, when the recordings became illegal, the 78s, people hid them under their beds. They came out one by one after the war and became LPs, and then they became C uh, cassettes and CDs, and we have those. And those were our but records. But they're always repeated because they didn't, they didn't survive. Most of those uh, records didn't survive. So there's, you know, about 12, of, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that's it. That, that's all you get of uh, their, their, uh, their original uh, songs. And but the sound is so unique. And as Barry and I keep on reminding ourselves, there was no auto-tune. This yeah. was a needle dropped on wax. And that was it. And if it wasn't right, you threw that one out. And, and they're always in tune. It's mm -hmm. incredible. Yeah. Yeah. incredible. Eric made us a playlist for, uh, I think it's called Harmony Warm Up, and it's, <laughs> it's their music. And it's just so unique. And to be able to attempt to emulate that sound is incredible. What was it like to actually get into a rehearsal room and develop a chemistry with each other? I mean, you're fantastic. I feel like people will be doing reunions of you all for the rest of time. We've been working together for two years now, the six of us. Mm -hmm. Started September 2021, workshops into the off-Broadway production, masks yeah. all completely full on in the middle of COVID. Mm -hmm. And I think Warren Carlyle just bringing that energy into the space, the specificity of his direction and choreography, let us explore, let us try to find what is funny, what fails, what's funnier than that, and, and that's how we found things. But also wanting to bring so much of ourselves. And yeah. the six of us are very different people. Mm -hmm. And I think like through rehearsal, through this whole journey, like we have found such love for one another. That's the biggest thing for me is to be able to do this and do it with people that I feel like I'm lock and step with and like our hearts are beating at the same pulse. Peace, I'm Common and you're watching the Broadway show. Love. It takes a whole lot of people to keep a Broadway show running, that's for sure. From the actors on stage to the orchestra, and of course the people behind the scene, whose names you don't see in the playbill. Our man Perry is on the town. So we are backstage of the Gershwin in the stage management office with the lady herself, Cell. This is crazy, the, the emotion, the energy, we're about to start a show. So tell me how you came to Wicked. So I graduated college and my first gig, I would say, was to be an intern for Mary Beth, who is the production stage manager at Wicked. Uh, she was here when I was an intern more than 10 years ago. And I went to do many shows. I was on the road when I was 20s. I went to uh, 40, 42 states, I wow. think, in America, because I did a lot of tours. Then I came back to New York City and my lovely friends, two lovely stage managers, decided to leave Wicked after a pandemic. I was the luckiest person at the time that they chose me to be a part of this production, and I feel very lucky still. So a show as massive as this, I mean, you've got flying bubbles, you've got, you know, flying witches, uh, you've got all sorts of things going on, and you're there, you know, kind of running the whole rehearsal. Is that it's extra amazing. pressure? Oh, yes, every day. <laughs> every day there's the extra pressure because this show is so loved by everybody. Every day I start the show and I was like, you know what? I was that girl, I really loved this show. So I feel a little pressure that I need to do a good job for the audience or the girl I was like 20 years ago. Pretty much we have a great day and then we have fun at work, yeah. That's wonderful. I always say, you know, it might be your 200th time doing it, but it's some audience member's first time to do exactly. it. Exactly. I, I, it brings that magic. Absolutely. In a day, I can get to see the audience when I walk through the house and when I see them excited and they have playbills, their smiles, drinks them in their hands. That's the good reminder. That's the reason why I'm doing this job. And I need that reminder sometimes. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I, I might be as much of a fangirl of Wicked as you are. Do you mind showing me around? Oh, I don't mind it at all. I can show you the calling station where we call the show. Let's do it. Okay. So this is actually where the magic happens. This is where you call it from. Yes, this is where we call. It's fantastic. We have a view of the stage right here. We don't have to use a monitor, but we have the monitor. So how many cues are you calling out of this thing? How many like cues are there in this show? So we have almost 300 cues. Almost 300 like yeah. And that's not talking about the automation and all the, the no, magic. We would, yes, because we would flip these switches for um, automation and auto flight and a rail. But yeah, we have 300 cues for lights. Just remarkable. Yeah. So I, I know how amazing and wonderful this show is to me, but I got to ask you, 
I normally say, what does Broadway mean to you? But it is the 20th anniversary of Wicked. What does Wicked on Broadway mean to you? It really means everything to me. Um, I know a lot of people say their favorite show um, is Wicked, but mine is Wicked. Um, I was listening and singing along with their original cast member you know, album. I was translating uh, English to Japanese, the Wicked lyrics, just because I loved it so much. And, and I think if I didn't meet Wicked when I was um, middle school, I don't think I would be here, meaning I don't think I would have chosen this profession without Wicked. That's going to do it for us, but for tickets or if you want to check out extended cuts of all these interviews, you can head on over to Broadway.com. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show.